My number 10 is The Sound of Metal, directed by Darius Martyr. Um, so this film obviously follows Riz Ahmed, and it kind of covers a musician who loses his hearing. So he has to navigate through these different circumstances in life, and it really focuses on opening yourself up to something, even though it may be scary and it may be something new and something you didn't expect to happen in your life. Um, and I just love that the way they show the deaf community in this film and the way they show it seen through the eyes of someone who's brand new to it, um, I just think it handles this type of situation in a very patient way, a very quiet way. Um, and I just think overall the sound design is superb. The performances, um, we have like so many, we have Paul Racy, Olivia Cook, Riz Ahmed, all three of those are such incredible displays of, you know, their, their ability to shine in a film that might not be the most extravagant display of like acting ability um but because it is so patient um they do a really beautiful job in that so sound of metal my number 10. my number nine is lee one l's the invisible man uh probably a surprise to no one i definitely covered this earlier on within the year but i think lee one l masterfully crafts a film that shows the horrors of life mixed in with this supernatural or science element um i think he takes this this story that we've already seen a hundred times before, and he really does make it his own by changing the perspective uh, into Elizabeth Moss's character. And he grounds this story through the use of this like real world trauma. And he shows this man that's haunting her. Um, obviously she suffers from abuse within this story. And so not only does the story show itself in the way of like the invisible man but it's also kind of that metaphor for trauma and the, through like the abuse that she endured and so he's everywhere nowhere all at once um it's just kind of one of those things even when she's in the shower he's he's watching her and she feels that presence and the way that was shown on screen i just think is so chilling i remember i came out of that screening and there was like a one girl who's just shaking it's it's one of those things that i love the fact i think this is the only one on my entire list that I experienced in a theater. Um, and I'm so happy that I was able to see this one in a theater because it's very, very special. From the performance from Elizabeth Moss, from Aldous Hodge, um, everybody involved with this film, this was just a home run for me. Yeah, I really I really dug this movie too. I, this was a late catch for me. Like I, I missed it in theaters. I actually didn't see it until like the very end of the year. And wow, what a, what a, what a grand speaking movie. It's actually on my honorable mentions list. Um, but that movie is so great because it's like a great balance of like suspense and like action, but also just like pure like emotion too. Like and you could just read it and feel it all over Elizabeth Moss's performance and like just through her facial expressions and just do like that looming fear and just do that like crazy camera work sometimes. Like sometimes the camera will just do like a random circle around like the roof of the uh, house. And I'm just like, oh, what is that about? Like is is he is that the perspective of the the dude inside of the invisible man like who is he who is this even you know like and just so many um so many cool interesting angles that this movie takes i'm just really really a big fan of it i think that's my favorite part too is the camera work and the way that lee winnell directs and he's just so energetic with the camera i think that's the word to use and he just loves moving it around if you've seen upgrade that's another one where he really emphasizes yeah. the camera and the direction of a movie, even though it's a small budget movie, I think both those movies are under 10 mil. Uh, so it goes to show you his uh, p prowess in directing. It's really cool. My number eight is Promising Young Woman, directed by Emerald Fennell. Um, so for Promising Young Woman, I, guys, this list, I really genuinely thought this would be higher. Um, but regardless, um, I'm super confident with the rest of the films that I do have. And there were so many that I loved, but this film, I still highly recommend it. Um, it's so much more than what we think it is. Even by the trailer, it looks like something super like this revenge flick. It's so glossy and it is, it is glossy and it is candy coated. Um, but it's not like your average revenge flick. Um, I think in moments it's super tough to watch, but overall it tells the story in a very realistic way. And it kind of, comments on you know internalized misogyny we cover not just oh men are bad we see it with women as well it covers all the different bases of what we experience in our society and one more thing that i love about this film that i didn't even realize on a first watch but i feel like with a lot of its casting it's very very purposeful 
We have people like Bo Burnham. We have Christopher Mintz Plas. These are all people that we just see in films typically as like the good guy, like the chill, nerdy, sweet, good guy. And it kind of shows all the different facets of every single person. And even if somebody has their life together, they can still have biases in different ways. And then when it affects their life, that's when they kind of change their minds and switch up on it. And it and it does really display that in something that's a really interesting way like I said, definitely really hard to watch, um, goes in different directions that I didn't think it was going to go into. And so overall, I can understand people coming out of this film and having a kind of mixed reaction. But I think everything that happens is very purposeful and it is very realistic. Um, and so even if I don't 100% enjoy every single aspect of it, I do feel like there's so much to touch upon and there's a conversation that we can have surrounding this film about people standing up for what they believe in, people sacrificing a lot of their own life for what they believe in to make a specific change, even if it's just so small and it's their town or it's something else. Um, I just feel like there's a lot to explore with Promising Young Woman. And again, Carrie Mulligan's performance, I, I definitely think this is one of the best films I've ever seen her in. Um, obviously, we have other stuff like Wildlife. Um, those are just kind of the ones that stand out to me. But this one is something so different because she has to play a different type of character uh, the way we see her. She's playing a specific type of woman at clubs. She's When she's herself, she's hurt and she's distraught. And it's just, it's. I think it's really emotional to see how something has overtaken her own life and has even affected like her family and things like that. Um, I just think overall, this really was an incredible, unique film. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, um, yeah, I was very, um, I had a very, you know, it's a, it's a tough movie to, you know, have a, have a, have a reaction to. Um, but you know, the one thing that is, uh, you know, because it's just hard subject matter, you know, hard, hard subject yeah. material, because it's something that affects a lot of women on a very regular basis. But one thing you can't deny about Promising Young Woman is, you know, it's brave, it's bold, it takes risk in a lot of places that I think a lot of movies would be really, really scared to take a lot of risk on. And I think it's, uh, it's I think it's, you know, I, I really do admire um, how ambitious it is, how thought out it is, how meticulous it is. Um, and like you said, the performance by Carrie Mulligan, um, is absolutely like it's electric, but also like heartbreaking and tragic too, to some extent as well. So it's like, you know, especially when, um, it gets into the backstory and her motivation as to why she is doing, um, a lot of these things to begin with. So yeah, I, overall, I, I really, really enjoy this film. This is on my, this is another one of my honorable mentions, um, too, but I can, um, yeah, I, I totally think this should be up there and is worthy of the recognition, for sure. Yeah, obviously, Promising Young Woman is one of the best f films of the year, for sure. It's definitely in my honorable mentions. It's so interesting how this film talks about generational change. I believe mm -hmm. all the characters are around my age, like 30-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, and it talks about, like, well, that was a different time. It was a different time. Like, if you take a shot every time they say different time, you'll be drunk. Mm -hmm. But it really is one of those things where it shows you like, damn, so much can change in five, six years um, where people did some things in the past and you start to think about it and you're like, man, that was evil. That was vile. Uh, and you didn't even consider it back then. But now you really start to think about it and you start to say, wait a minute, this was not okay. And it never was okay. Even though it was a different time, it, still shouldn't be, it, sh it still should not be okay. Um, so I really love how that's touched upon throughout the whole film as well. My number seven is Possessor, directed by Brandon Cronenberg, David Cronenberg's son. Uh, nepotism made points with this one, okay? So uh, basically, this film is super interesting. Um, I had no idea what to expect going into it. I just saw the poster and I was like, all right, cool, I'm in. Um, but basically, it is a body swap assassination horror film. Uh, a corporate assassin takes control of other people's bodies using this like brain implant type of uh, technology and they execute high profile targets. So they swap into other people's bodies, complete randoms. Uh, they m ensure that they die at the end. So then they get transported back into their own body. It's just absolutely wild. Number one, I will say truly, this is one of the goriest films that I've seen in a very, very long time. Honestly, to be expected, but there were a few moments. I'm pretty, usually I'm not sensitive to that kind of stuff, but there was moments where I had to get up out of my couch for a little bit. Um, I would have loved to see this in a theater. I love the way 
Brandon Cronenberg directed this like body switch. When that swap is happening, I just feel like it's one of the most interesting things. And also this is like super dystopian, um, but I do feel like it kind of talks about the world that we live in and directions that we might be going in our reality. Uh, it feels super, super fresh, even though we've seen assassin films before, of course, with this whole body swapping idea. And it kind of deals with like psyche, cyber surveillance, also just like family and relationships, which I think is something really interesting. And uh, we have Christopher Abbott, and this is the second film I've seen him in this year. And I wasn't too familiar with him before. And the other film was Black Bear. And that's another one on my honorable mentions that I loved him in. Uh, but he did such a great job. And Andrea, Andrea Riseborough, the way we are introduced to her in the beginning of the film and the way we end with her at the end, it was just, I was haunted. Um, so I highly recommend to check this out if you guys haven't already. My number six, whew, I'm cheating here. Uh, I'm gonna cheat, I know. Uh, I'm gonna put the entire Small Axe series. I hate to do it, I'm so sorry. If I had to if I had to separate these, it would just be like two, three, four, but like, you know what I mean? Uh, it's really, really tough. So I'm just gonna put it all into one. Uh, I guess I'll give a special shout out to like Mangrove and Lovers Rock, of course. So I'm gonna have all of those kind of in this one and we've talked about it a ton but again i do think these are some of the most moving touching profound like empowering pieces of work that we've seen all throughout the past year no matter what uh, these are some of the most important stories it reflects our society now it reflects the society in the uk right now and it just shows us like even as much time like passes it, stuff doesn't change like we need to continue on and work harder to make sure that this this changes like because when we talk about we're talking about 60s and 70s it feels like forever ago and it was and so it's really really tough to see those situations on screen and know that we still get a lot of that reflected in our daily lives so small acts entirely underrated um obviously we had an old a whole episode about it we all did reviews um guys make sure you check that out and check out these films i know i'm lumping five films into my number six i'm sorry uh, I think we're going to talk about it a little later, RB3. Is that correct or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, well, I mean, this will probably be a good time for me to, like, shout out, like, some of them. Well, yeah, we'll probably shout them out later. But, yeah, I, I did have I have one of the small axes uh, on, on on the list. Uh, yeah, me but, too. Yeah, I, uh, I probably, I guess that, you know, I guess that probably is going to represent the whole series as well. Because, yeah. yeah, it just, it all feels like one thing anyway, so. My number five, uh, Malcolm and Marie, directed by Sam Levinson. Uh, I feel like this is the quarantine movie. Um, I feel like this is a product of everything that happened in 2020. This would not exist if, you know, we didn't have everything that happened. So it's a direct reflection. Um, I just think it's really interesting. And obviously it follows this, like, toxic relationship through the story um, between John David Washington and Zendaya. And by the time this is up, uh, it's basically going to be hitting Netflix. So I'd highly recommend checking it out. Uh, it's not the easiest watch for sure. And it's not the most fun watch. It touches on a lot of really dark things, like honestly, really real things. It, it touches on drug abuse. It touches on addiction. It touches on all these different things. Um, but, but most importantly, that something that we see through John David Washington and Zendaya is just like the intricacies of a relationship and kind of a degradation of a relationship. Most of the time we see them, they're not happy. They're not happy basically at all throughout this entire film. Um, and it's just really interesting to see how people who are in relationships for like a long period of time, the way that they kind of interact, honestly. Um, and it's super, it's super sad to see, but um, I was just kind of shocked. And one of the reasons why it is so high on my list and the reason why I really enjoyed it was because it was also really funny. There was a lot of really funny moments where we were laughing at the characters. We were laughing at their behavior, mostly John David Washington. Um, and that's something that just kind of stood out to me. And I do think there's a lot of really interesting, although self-indulgent commentary on just like art, art criticism, everything that like we kind of talk about, the industry, uh, just uh, just all of these different things, uh, just kind of like elitism in the industry, all, all these different ideas that I think are handled in a very funny way, uh, a very interesting way and engaging way to kind of look at it. 
as somebody who doesn't understand uh, the film industry or for somebody who doesn't understand the film industry or like film criticism and, you know, kind of all those press runs when you interview actors and you talk to directors and things like that, it's just really funny to get the other side of it uh, <laughs> through like a director's perspective. So I, I just think Malcolm and Marie, those performances from John David Washington and Zendaya, I think they were two of my favorites of the entire year. I, I think Zendaya deserves at least an Oscar nom for this one. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I definitely agree. You know, uh, the acting for both of, between both of the performers was, was just um, on point. And yeah, I mean, it, it is it is a tough movie to watch. It definitely, for me, I, you know, I, I personally have some, some, some qualms with it. But, you know, that being said, though, it is, it's definitely no, like you said, it's definitely no denying, like, the style and the and the and the and the craftsmanship of it is definitely there. Um, you know, like I said in the review, I really loved the storytelling of it. I just didn't love like the story necessarily, um, but you know, it was really there. Uh, I do gotta say though, Sabrina, you know, the, the nepotism on your list is a little strong uh, between Brandon Cronenberg, uh, Brandon Cronenberg, uh, 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 and um, and, uh, John and uh, Sam Livingston. Yeah, well, Sam Livingston too is uh, the son of director Barry Livingston. Yeah. Uh, wow. And John David Washington. Ooh, yeah, nepotism yeah. got me this 2020 without even realizing it's it. Hollywood royalty. Damn. Nepotism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. My number four is Nomadland, directed by Chloe Zhao, somebody we shouted out last week on Best Directors. So, Nomadland, um, it's really interesting because I know it is like based off of a book. And something that I kind of mentioned last week, and something that we've seen from a few directors, like the Safdie brothers, it's another thing that we talked about last year, is mixing in real life people in with these characters. Uh, and it almost gives it, it gives a film like Nomadland this like documentary like approach where it feels so authentic. It feels like you're genuinely looking into this. If we had a no name actress rather than Frances McDormand, I might genuinely believe that we're watching somebody's real life story play out it's just so intimate and it's that intimate candid display of like people who are connected to the earth and obviously this happens after like the great recession and there's just so much loss not even just financially um in a lot of these people's lives there's different loss um health wise or like relationship wise um in their family and these people are like downtrodden and there's so many other hardships that they kind of focus on within this film and they're so freed it's like they're they're on their own other way they're connected to the earth they're free and they have this wonderful wonderful worldview and wonderful community that they're opened up to um i just think like chloe Zhao is a powerhouse of a director and a storyteller some of the monologues that we get within this film from these actors or from these real life people are so incredible and it just hangs on to their faces for far too long and it feels so invasive and intrusive um and it's just absolutely beautiful i mentioned it last week like i was getting terrence malick like vibes but just in a completely different way in something where i don't want to compare this to another filmmaker it it is rightfully like her own um and from francis mcdormand's performance to everything else this is such such a standout and Chloe Zhao deserves Best Director, and Frances McDormand, who always, always doing an incredible job. Are, are we ready for my number three? Let's do it. All right, well, let's go straight to the same film. Minari right. is my number three of the year. Um, yeah, Minari just touched me in a completely different sense because, um, it was obviously, a similar sense as you as well, but like, I, I am a first generation American, but my family, um, my dad came from Mexico when he was about six years old. My mom came when she was nine. They kind of had the opposite experience where they really like they, we had some of the cultures and the traditions and things like that, but they really embraced American culture so quickly on the South side of Chicago. So seeing a situation like this and hearing stories from my grandma, both, both of my grandparents on either side, um, I just... It, this film just hit me so, so deeply. It was so impactful for all the things that you guys said before, but like focusing on these immigrants coming into a place that like we know the reality. We don't get to see any of these, these negative things, but like in the 80s, like during this time, 
immigrants still to this day are looked at in such a negative way. And it, this just shows how hardworking somebody has to like do to sacrifice so much and build something from the bottom up. You are coming here with no foundation, nothing to fall back on at all. Um, so just that beautiful display of sacrifice and family and representing all these like different elements of this transition that they kind of have and like the hardships that they face in their day-to-day -day life. Because like I said, they don't have something to fall back on, but just kind of at the core when we have like the character of David and the kid and the relationship even just like between him and his grandma, uh, how that progresses throughout the film. There's so many different beautiful layers to this film that I can't wait to rewatch it again because I actually just saw it um, and it immediately shot, shot to the top of my list. I just thought it was so moving. It was so heartbreaking. It was so optimistic. Obviously we have the moment in the film that my heart just sank so 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 far there's like a few of those but um just showing how resilient they are and yeah Steven Yeun's performance it's it's one of those things that has to be recognized but again this is a an American story this is the most American story that I've seen in so long um so I wish it was recognized that way but of course you know we don't always get that um but yeah Minari is number three of my 2020 list yeah very well put, Sabrina. My number two film is Never Rarely, Sometimes Always. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every Everything that you said, um, I echo it. I think this film is absolutely so special. I do think this is the most important film this year, um, even though I do have it at number two. I think this is from a perspective that we never get to see. We never get to spend this prolonged time uh, in a situation like this, and it is so uncomfortable, and we get those moments. And I feel like it kind of displays like predation and men in a specific way, and it shows through the lens of teenage girls what you have to go through, whether you're on public transit, whether you're in a city, whether you're you're in your own home. Um, I just feel like it's one of those situations where if I could force anybody, no matter what side of an argument you're on, to just sit down and put themselves into someone's perspective. This kind of shows it's like if some if an issue does not directly affect your life, if you don't own a uterus or whatever, you shouldn't be able to have an opinion on what somebody else does. To have a 17-year-old girl go through all of these first of all, dangerous to just run away and go to another city to sleep in the subway bathrooms or whatever, um, go through these dangerous experiences to do something uh, behind everybody's back because she has to go through all these loopholes. She has to cross state lines and she has her cousin there along with her for all of that because again, that is somebody who is her age, who is understanding of the situation. And the performance from Sydney Flanagan, I know it's something that we've talked about all this year, Andres, like you and I just keep mentioning it, uh, is something so, so spectacular, so special. I can't wait to highlight it more whenever we do the Cuddy Awards and things like that. But also Talia Ryder and even like Sharon Van Etten, one of my favorite musicians playing the mother in this film. Um, there's just so many different aspects of it that I think this is so quiet and so patient. And I know I've said that for other films, but it is done so purposely to put us in those uncomfortable situations. Uh, like, like I said before, that never rarely, sometimes always scene is the best scene of 2020. My number one of 2020 is Charlie Kaufman's I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Really? RB3 can see right through me. Wow. Uh, I already knew the second I finished it, this is, this is one of my favorite films easily of like the last few years honestly um Char this is like charlie kaufman's best direction so far in my opinion i feel like it deals with the what ifs in life and it's a cautionary tale told through a different perspective um i think it focuses on the human condition but it does so in a way that's very kaufman of course and this isn't originally his story this is adapted from a novel that i read and it's completely different like it's not completely different but it's it's not just you're taking a novel and adapting it but he made it his own and he made it a completely like separate thing where you can enjoy both for different reasons. Um, he still found a way to make it unique and it's dizzying, erratic, didn't go the way that I thought it was gonna go at all, especially judging off the trailers. I think it's this beautiful puzzle that I'm still finding new elements of it, like in rewatches, but not in a frustrating way at all, but just new layers every single time in, in a way that it opens up to even more ideas and more conversation. It's super rich 
super layered. Um, but ultimately, I the way I see it is a man ending his life and looking back on a reflection of what what he could have achieved, but just didn't have the courage to. Um, and it genuinely affected me. Uh, I kind of talked about it a little bit when we did our Kaufman episode of The Meaning Of, and I binged every single Kaufman movie in like a week. I did not feel great afterwards and I didn't feel great after this movie. And I think that's something that I really enjoy because I want to be affected. I want to be moved by a story like this. Um, and even though it is dark and it is dreary, I do think it's very beautiful in that way. And Jesse Plemons, Tony Collette, Jesse Buckley, David Thewlis, um, I just think these were incredible performances and even just a lot of the scenes that were happening, they were so damn weird and I was here for it. Like we got the pig, we have all of that. Um, I just think this is my standout. This is my highlight. This is like, this is me. This is my kind of film. Uh, Charlie Kaufman knew what he was doing. He knew he had one audience member uh, and that's why it's my favorite of 2020. Yeah, no, I, I 100% hear you on that. It's, it was one, it was really, it was literally just like so close to making it. It was almost, it was up in, on my list up until like the very, very end. That was the last one I kicked off. And yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed it too. Like I'm a big fan of Charlie Kaufman as well and a big fan of his direction. And, um, and you know, I, I did, um, there were some parts of this movie that I, 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 I liked, but I didn't like love, um, you know, particularly like the, when, the, the segments like between when they were like, like, I love the whole car, like ride, like to the, to, to the house. But I feel like when it got to the house, it, it took a little bit of a different turn. And I was like, us oh, is a little strange, but I was all for it too. Um, but now overall, I really, 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 really dug, uh, uh, I'm thinking of ending things. <laughs>